Um, so I think that finding the kind of client that I could serve best, even if it wasn't the one that I would have like said, oh, this is the one that is the, the coolest or the prettiest. I've really fallen in love with a client that I think values, you know, color and vibrancy. And, um, and, and once I said, you know, I want clients that like what I like, because that's really all I can make. Um, I started finding clients that were a little bit more eclectic or would do different things. And that's, that's really where I would, you know, get excited. Well, hey, welcome to the show, Perry. You are a awesome person. We met in person just a little bit ago in Canada at Engage, yeah. which was really yeah. fun. And I've admired your work for a long time and just excited yeah. to have you on here to share your knowledge. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited. I'm, I love to talk, so I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, well, give for people that don't know a lot of your story, could you give, I mean, you have you have a little bit of a different background, um, but mm -hmm. maybe where you started out and then how you ended up getting into photography? Yeah. So um, I grew up in a really small town in North Carolina, very rural, um, all by myself. I have no siblings, um, so it's just me. Um, my mom was always into photos, but like to an annoying level. So I hated it and didn't want anything to do with it. Um, and, you know, basically I didn't have any visions of being a photographer to begin with. I was always focused on getting out of my little town and getting out of the not fun childhood situation I was in and just finding my way out. Um, and so I immediately, as soon as I could, I went to college and I was like, I'm going to be an academic. Cause that was like, that was my vision of what the, how to get out and how to do something great, you know? So I went to school and I got my undergrad and my history basically, or my, um, my undergrad and master's in history and historic preservation. Um, and all along, I always had this pull to photos, but I didn't want to acknowledge it because, you know, my mom was the crazy photo taker and it was so annoying, you know? <laughs> so, was she just like just shooting photos around or oh, was she like doing that for work? Badgering. No, she shot, she has shot a wedding before, all right. but she said it went terribly. And, um, I'm not surprised because she's a little bit of an anxious person. Um, so um, she always shot, you know, she was obviously shooting on film and I tried to play with her cameras. And in high school, I was on like the yearbook staff and I was taking the photos. And even when I was going into history and trying to become a historian, I always was pulled to, I guess, the visuals of history, which is why I focused on like historic preservation, which is like um, basically buildings and architecture and cities, because I wasn't, I mean, I like being an academic, but I really wasn't into like the book and the words. I was into the, the visuals, you know, um, I definitely stuck out in the history department. I will say <laughs> there was just me and a lot of, you know, guys that, you know, only watch Star Wars and we didn't, I could, I was like, oh, I want to talk about stuff with people. Um, you know, and so, you know, photography, I really focused on even my master's thesis was, was on like early American photographers and. I mean, just very convoluted versions of what photography was in early history, you know, but I was always drawn to it. And then I started shooting um, for fun. And I had a girl basically message me. I had a blog early on about my, this is way before, this is like 2008 or nine that right. I would take pictures on. And I had a girl message me and basically say, oh, your photos are really beautiful. Will you take pictures at my wedding? And I was like, sure. And I had like, never really done that. You know, I'd taken my own pictures. Um, so before that, I actually was like, I'm going to reach out to people and see if I could shoot a wedding before that one. Like I need <laughs> some experience. So I asked a girl I went to high school with and I said, Hey, I saw you're engaged, you know, like on early days of Facebook. And I said, and this is so terrible. Somebody should never do this. But I was like, can I just show up and, you know, take pictures while you're a photographer shooting? <laughs> but she was like, oh, no, you can just shoot it. Which, thank God, because how rude would that have been totally. if I actually did that? <laughs> but so she just asked me to show up and she paid me $300. And I was like, jackpot. You know? <laughs> like, um, and I shot her wedding and it was just so thrilling. It, as many things as went wrong, like I had never really even been to a wedding but my own. So like I was like trying to remember what parts of the day happened. And I remember during the cake cutting, I ran out of room on my memory card <laughs> and I had to like delete a picture and then take a picture and like delete a picture. So I started off with a bang. Like I didn't really second shoot. I didn't do anything. I just threw myself um, into it. And I honestly, I, I didn't really pursue it. It kind of came after me after that. You know, she shared a lot of pictures. I shot another one and it, I mean, I shot like 20 weddings the first year I ever even started shooting. Wow. Now, mind you, I might have been charging $500, but 
it, I got a lot of experience really, really fast. So, and so that, that was crazy. in 2008 ish, or is um, it was um in 2012. 12. Okay. I, it's very recent. Yeah. Considering how much I've done in the meantime. Yeah. So. That's incredible. Uh huh. And so when looking at that, then when did you decide to like leave the historian route and actually pursue photography? And what was that like? Yeah. You know, I think I, um, I never, it's one of those things where you want to be an actress or you want to do something that you really love and you never think you could get paid well to do it, you know? And I never had that as my goal. Um, I obviously spent a lot of time in school and I was almost persistent to the point. I was like, I'm not leaving this job because I went to school for it. Um, and so I worked for three years as a professional historian, um, you know, all the nitty gritty of nonprofit and all that goes with it. And I really honestly just, I didn't want to give it up. I thought for a long time I could do both. And I got to the point where I think the last year before I quit, I did 37 weddings. And I was like, this isn't sustainable. <laughs> like, um, and, you know, I honestly, I got enough money under contract for the next, you know, calendar year that it met my salary. And I was like, yeah, I don't need this. I, I need to just leave, you know. Um, and nonprofit, nonprofit isn't the best paying version of, <laughs> you know. So I think when I just really started realizing that I didn't have to do that anymore, I still loved it. So I never left it for that reason. Um, but I mean, photography just took over. It became a monster of its own. So when you were doing that year where you had 40, 37 37. Mm -hmm. and still working a (laughs) full-time job, I'm assuming most of that was local. Yes. Yeah. 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 Or, you know, I had a really flexible job. It was just me and my boss, Gary, um, who was like my bestie in those years. It had no coworkers. I have so much personality and I had nobody to talk to, but (laughs) Gary was really great um, in understanding. I don't think he ever knew it would take me away from the job or he might not have let me off early. Um, But we, we worked together, you know? And so every now and then I would take off a little bit early on a Friday or honestly, I would just leave after work and drive like long hours to get some of the distance. Cause I've always really shot all over. Um, And I would drive five hours after work and then get there really late and then do the wedding the next day. So I kind of just made it work, which is exhausting, but I didn't have kids. So it's not that exhausting. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I know. Um, (laughs) You were married at the time? Yes. Yeah. Uh Cool. When did y'all get married? In 2010. And I met him when I was 19. So I've been with him for 12 and a half years. Whoa. (laughs) People can do some math and figure out how old you are. I know, I know. Yeah, you add it up. It goes really fast. And I met him on Facebook, too. Whoa. Mm -hmm. All right. Social media brought us together. All right. If you guys could see pictures, they are quite the the couple. Uh, Tell you what. (laughs) (laughs) He would love hearing that. (laughs) He gets great pictures taken of himself. That's for sure. (laughs) Well, he's got a good person to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. So I I mean, what I really like to draw out of people, because you've you've done since 2012 and just Uh getting started and taking $500 a wedding or $300 Mm -hmm. a wedding, going to right now, you're, I would consider you one of the more successful photographers. You know, there's there's a nice in the upper echelon. And so what I I like to sort of draw out, like, what does that look like? Because I mean, obviously- How do you yeah, get the, the transition. To... Totally. Yeah. How did it how did it go from there to there? When did you start deciding like, oh, I need to raise my rates? And how do you do that? And because that's that's a scary thing for people. I mean, even even at the level that you and I are at, to go like, okay, I need to raise oh, my yeah. rates, it's still scary, you know? So oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think I've always been super intentional. I never left anything up to just I mean, other than photography coming and pulling me out of the shadows after I was in it, you know, I was very hyper focused on how to make it work. Um, And I do remember in the early days and I still almost think I'm this way. I was a proponent for what I called charging peanuts to begin with, because I didn't feel like. I should charge a lot more to begin with because I didn't have the experience, you know. Now, with that said, I definitely think there's a line to that because I didn't charge peanuts for long. When I got that experience, my prices started going up right away. And I would raise, you know, $200 a wedding um, because, I mean, at the time, it was blowing my mind (laughs) that I could get $800 or $1,000 a wedding. But I didn't do it for long, you know. Um, But I, I just felt like you know, at the time it would maybe be disingenuous to charge a lot more and not have the experience because, you know, shit happened. Oh, 
can you are you gonna beat me please okay yeah. <laughs> like it happens on totally. wedding days and, and experience you know to me now that's what my clients are paying for is all of the experience and the talent and stuff that I honed so I started off the first was 300 and then my second was 500 I might have stayed at 800 for a couple and then you know 12 so I just kind of raised incrementally and really I honestly have always based it on supply and demand even today that's how I manage my prices because I mean, I was a historian. I studied consumerism. Like, I really know how consumerism worked. And I didn't really understand any other theories beyond supply and demand. That's how business works, you know? So I basically, um, I would have a lot of people coming to me, and I would feel comfortable raising my prices. Um, I never raised them if I didn't have a lot of interest. But thankfully, I feel like I've been really blessed to always have a lot of interest. And I just raise it high enough that I don't scare that away. Um, um, so actually for the last four, maybe four or five years, I've kept a running spreadsheet that I track every single month, how many bookings I have for the following year. So I could tell you this is November, let's say the end of October, cause I tracked by the last day. So by the end of October in 2018, 17, 16, 15, maybe 14, I know how many weddings, you know, both total contract, but also numbers wise, how many I had for the next season. And so that has allowed me, because I can track it that well, if I was low, I would be like, ooh, like I need to get a couple more to stay current and stay where I'm at. And, you know, sometimes allow like a six hour wedding to get on the books or just to make sure that I'm sustaining it. And then the same goes if I was way over booking, that is when I'm like, okay, these prices are going up, you know, and I've never dropped them back down. So I try to be really smart when I raise them because it's kind of, I don't know, that would be hard to then lessen price. <laughs> you know totally um, so I just was really intentional about how I tracked it um, and then I just raised it based on demand for the most part totally yeah and so I I get all that but just to break it down maybe for people mm -hmm. who are listening yeah. and going like what does that look like I, I guess I'm thinking about a, lo a lot of times you get an inquiry you know mm -hmm. and they're gonna say hey I like your work what are your prices you know so yeah. are you because you sort of know what that is, are you just changing your pricing as you're getting inquiries and sending those out or are no. you sending it out or how does that work for you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, honestly, I get a lot of inquiries and I, I know that a lot of them aren't going to have the price point, but I also have a family and I do not have time to like individually write up proposals. I know that maybe is terrible. I just don't. Yeah. Um, I have a set price point. And the only thing that really changes is, so I have an online link that I'll send when somebody inquires or planners always have it. So I can change it. And then the planner will always have that current rate. Or if somebody inquired two months ago, I can change that pricing, you know, because it, it's live and it's online. Um, but it's basically a link. And the only thing that changes is the travel, like I'll quote a different travel or something like that. Um, but um, it's basically just all there and I don't have to worry about it. So when somebody comes to me and they've already seen my pricing and they want to talk, that's when I really can invest my time and that sort of thing. So um, it's just really hard, honestly, to keep up with and know who can afford, you know, like, cause I mean, maybe only 5% of the people that inquire have the ability to, to pay, you know, the, the prices. So 95% of inquiries not able to pay was really hard to keep up with. Totally. Um, yeah, so I just, I don't have that part of my my workflow. I wait till they come back and say, well, yeah, I got your pa your packet and I want to talk. And I know they've seen the prices, so. Got it. But I guess with that, though, if you are increasing your prices based on supply and demand, like mm -hmm. how are, you know, you have your links. So are you just like, as you book a certain amount, then you're like, okay, I'm going to gradually bring it up. Yes. Now, the, now the new inquiry that's, or now the new packet that's going out. Got it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For sure. It's, it's really simple. I don't make it complicated. I don't have time. <laughs> to That's make it great. Yeah. Well, I make everything in my life complicated. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> Do you see some wonderful, amazing proposal for every great wedding. I try to, I mean, I try to not give out pricing initially uh -huh. because I like, I like to, and I FaceTime with all my couples because most of them are from all over the country or world, yeah. you know, yeah. which I'm sure same as with you, but I sort of want the chance to like one char like lay on a little bit of charm. And then yes! also yes. I like to, because, you know, I feel like that's my biggest yes. selling point is being able to really convey, Hey, this is, this is my personality, what I bring to the table. And yes. I mean, you know, I tell brides all the time. I was like, listen, I'm going to be basically your maid of honor. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm one of the bridesmaids <laughs> and your maid yeah. of honor is going to be jealous. 
because yeah. like, you know, you'll see me more than you'll see the groom, you know, that yeah, sort of stuff. For sure. And I think it's, there's different being like a guy versus a girl and you know, there's pros yeah, and cons, you know, and I think, I think you're so right. And I honestly, I think that is, um, you know, a reason for some of my success because I'm like you, like, I love people. I want to talk to them, you know, um, I want to spend time with them. Um, and one way that I found to do that, because I think I just personally pick and choose what I'll spend my time on. Um, if I'm struggling and I need some bookings and I'll get, I'll get real up in their face about making friends. Um, but I feel like a lot of people thankfully have felt like they know me when they're contacting, because I, I do spend a lot of time on Instagram and Instagram stories, you know, sharing who I am. And I think that anybody that checks in, you know, they can see any of the highlights and stuff. And that helps maybe to do a little bit of that for me, um, you know, across like anybody who's looking so I don't have to individualize it. So I think that really has helped me, you know, showing personality, especially on social media. And I do have some videos on my website that are a little bit of like frequently asked questions, but it's like me talking, like I'm talking to you. So I think maybe that helps that out a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, um, and, you know, honestly, once, once they kind of pass that litmus test of like, they can, they can afford it. You know, I don't, I just feel bad because I hate telling somebody a price when they get so excited and they get to know me and they're like, Oh, we love you. Let's do it. And then I'm like, Oh, here are the prices. And they're like, Oh dear God, like this is not, you yeah. know, no, absolutely. I, it's, it's, um, I just felt bad doing that, but I guess there's certainly a way if you do that a few times, you can get them to change their prices. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and I guess for me, I like to sort of see if this is a couple that I really connect with because what I've found for me is that's what's life giving is when it's the couple, the venue, the, you know, the environment, their friends, that sort of stuff from shooting weddings for so many years. Like that's what actually energizes me. So I really want to like, if this is a couple, I want to try to like, they, if I just sent my prices, I think they might not have had the conversation. So I generally try to have the conversation so I can try to talk them into being like, Hey, actually, I think it's, here's why I think you should spend a couple thousand dollars more than your budget is allowing. Or people are actually putting in money on top of what their parents are committing so that they can have me, you know, those sort of things. Um, Great. I think it definitely helps, you know. Um, I think for a while I probably, I don't know. I think, you know, at this point in my life, not necessarily my career, um, at this point in my life, I have two kids and I have a family and I've really got really where I want to be. I mean, I'm certainly, if I worked harder, I could get higher, but I, I put, I put my focus on other things. And I think for a while, I certainly spent the time. Now I do still sometimes send out, um, voice messages to texts. You know, if I get a great inquiry and I'll just send a text message out with a voice message or even sometimes a video, I'll just self selfie video something just to get like a little slice of personality to them without like a lot of extra back work. And sometimes you can get an idea if somebody can afford the price point just by the inquiry, you know, like yep. the location oh, or yeah. the planner or things like that, you know? Um, but I, you know, I'm going to be honest cause I think maybe I do it differently than you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and that I honestly show up to wedding days. It's not uncommon to show up and I, don't know what they look like. I don't know anything about them. I've never had a conversation with them. And that used to terrify me. Mm -hmm. But I've had so many amazing experiences where I just am able to get them to open up immediately. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's not uncommon. Like I do that fairly often, you know, Um, now I have some clients that they just have that desire to connect. And I'm all about it. Like I have some clients that we text all the time. We're messaging like, I mean, honestly, I've had clients that after the fact we go, we've been on rafting trips, we've been on vacations together. So I definitely connect if they want it, you know, but I have a lot of times, you know, planners will come to me cold asking for a date and I say, yeah, I'm available. And they say, great client wants you send the contract. And I never communicate with the client. Now I know, I know ideally I, I want to be friends, but I guess I don't have to. And at this point in my life, I'm kind of like, I'm okay because you know, it's a lot of time and totally. that you do to do that. Yeah. Um, and I want to do it if they want it, but I definitely have some clients that are amazing and warm and, um, and pay well and are okay not knowing any more than that, which is, you know, kind of a double-edged sword because I have the other clients who need to know everything about me and my family and stuff. Um, yeah. but I like it. I think it balances well at least. Totally. And then, so can you talk about just having a family and how that's changed things and being a mom and 
how I, I'd love to even hear how it works with your husband and because yeah. I know he's a stay at home dad. He and is. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Um, he always used to joke in the early days, you know, when I was making my big $500 wedding checks. He always used to joke that someday he was going to be a kept man and that he was, I mean, it was just a long running thing we'd always tease. Yeah. Because even when I, I met him when I was 19, he was an older man. He oh, was, yeah. He's six years older, but at 19, that's a big difference. Totally. Um, and so he always joked, you know, but he was the one making the money at the time. He was the one having a full time job and I was in school. Um, and it's funny because somewhere along the line, the universe just flipped us, you know, and um, I was pregnant with my first daughter and he worked. Uh, he didn't do a ton, you know, because I started, you know, I make good money, which is always awkward to say, but I make great money, yeah. you know. And so it's like, you know, it's what's the point of having paying somebody to watch the kids. So it was a funny situation to be the one that I'm like, okay, well I'll travel and I'll make the money and you stay home with the kids. Like it just felt weird, right? Yeah. Cause it's not an, it's not a typical dad thing. Um, but he's a great husband and he's, he's cool with that. So <laughs> that's good. Um, but yeah, it was an interesting transition. And even now I'm so used to the fact that he's a stay at home dad and he does the grocery shopping and he does the tasks for the house and, you know, takes care of the kids and takes one to preschool and he does all of that stuff. And I'm the one in the office, like, could you bring me this? You know, like I literally did that before we started the podcast, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's, it works so great for us. You know, I think it's an interesting thing. It's hard sometimes to be a mom or, a, you know, feel like I'm the one that's supposed to be the parent, the main caregiver and yeah, yeah. the lover and the snuggler of all the kids. And I'm like, mommy's working, you know, <laughs> totally. <laughs> mama's got a job to do, you know? So, um, you know, I think having a family, you know, having a husband is wonderful, but it is a different experience than having a family, you know, a spouse is different than children by a lot, you know, <laughs> we know this. And I think having kids, I, I had a point where I had to decide, you know, how much do I want to dedicate to time with the family? And how, what do I want to give up in terms of success to do this? And I think everybody has a different answer for that, you know. But for me, I was like, you know, they're only little for this really brief time. I'm not going to have that many. Two, we done. We're done. So I was like, I just, you know, I'm where I'm at and where I need to be. I have a great career. My husband's staying at home. I'm just going to, I'm going to allow this to, to relax a little bit. And I'm going to take a little bit of pressure off of business and work in terms of, you know, overworking or doing a ton of stuff just so that I can have time to really focus on these years. Now, those kids are in school and, and I'm going to turn this thing back into overdrive, you know, but to me, that's where I put my values at this stage of my life. Um, and I'm really grateful because I'm able to do that. I'm able to make the decision to say, you know what, I'm taking a lot of weddings. I want to take one or two less this year. I want to take a couple less because I don't want to be traveling so much, you know, which I do. Um, but it's, it's an everyday balance. Sometimes I suck at balance, you know, but yeah, no, I, I think it, that's a really, it's such a interesting and difficult topic because mm -hmm. I, th I think there's a lot of misconstrued ideas of what that should be. And I mean, there's, there's so much just even looking at your marriage and your working and that it's like, there's a lot of role reversals or, mm. or there's a lot, like I live in Southern California where cost of living is ridiculous, yeah. you know? And so a lot of our, I have a lot of friends in the wedding industry, a lot of, you know, wedding, the wives are wedding planners or florists, you know, yeah. and the husbands are, they're also work. you know, it's like the double jobs. And so there's, there's all of these situations where it's like, who should be doing what? And there's almost an expectation for everybody to be doing everything. And it's really, yeah. it's not possible to do everything really well. And so no. I think what happened, there's so many internal battles that happen of feeling like I should be doing this, but I'm doing that, or I should be doing that. And I should be doing, you know, yeah. is, is that how I have two questions based around that one would be for your husband, just socially, culturally, does mm -hmm. he, how does he feel about being stay-at-home dad? Does, I mean, understand, like you can look at it ideally and be like, oh, this is awesome. Yes. But socially, does he, like, how does he going out and being like, oh yeah, you know, I'm the stay-at-home yeah. dad. My wife's the breadwinner. Like yes. that's, that's one question. And then the other one would be, how is the mental challenge for you of like making those decisions around like family life oh and balance? Gosh. All the answers to those questions. <laughs> Come on, bring it. You know, first and foremost, I think um, being a stay-at-home dad it is a role reversal because it, it's like the original feminine tasks totally. of 
cooking every night. Like I had to cook once this week because my husband, you know, went out to do something, which he doesn't do often. And I was like, how do I cook? You know, like I felt like the quintessential bachelor, you know, because yeah. I've been doing it. So I think honestly, a big part has to do with who he is as a person, because I'm sure there's a lot of different dads that would handle that differently. Mm -hmm. um, but he's, he's a great guy. One of the reasons I actually met him on Facebook, because I did a search on Facebook for my perfect man back right. when it was for the universities. And I did a search and I chose a major. I was just thinking of like a hypothetical man. And I chose a major for a guy I thought would be kind, which was, um, I think it was like family and consumer services. I was like, I mean, a guy that's going to focus on families is going to be a good guy, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I had searched him on Facebook and I found him. He was handsome and I was, a, you know, went after him the way I, I do things. Um, and so, you know, he is that kind of guy. He started working working in family and consumer services and he works with people with disabilities before he quit his job, you know? Um, and so I think that he is naturally inclined to being good at those tasks, but socially for them, I don't think he likes for certain parts of it because, you know, we moved into our neighborhood and we're talking to new neighbors and they don't look at me. They're looking at him and they're like, so what do you do? And it was just such a reminder because all talking to him, like, you know, I was the housewife, you know, and it was such a reminder um, of the fact, like all our friends, this is how we live our life. But I, I was like, oh man, that's right. This is different. You know, I and would I, say probably, especially where you live versus a little more progressive. Yes, in the South. Like, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I'm in like deep <laughs> South out here. We're in rural North Carolina. Like it's not that common. Um, and so I think that you know, some days I think there's no overarching answer to that because some days he is like, I hit the lottery. Like I'm staying at home with my kids. He's got hobbies. Like he's living the life that I tell him he's on vacation, but he's got to watch kids. So let's be careful. This is not vacation, right? <laughs> um, yeah. My you know, wife would kill me if I described it that way. <laughs> I know. Good thing he won't watch this. It's not because I spend plenty of time with him too. But I mean, you know, there's so much free time that he does get for stuff. And I think he's very, he loves that because we both, we both had careers where we were given all of our time nine to five to another person and, it, you know, and doing other difficult tasks and having the kind of freedom that at least setting your own schedule gives you. He loves, you know, um, he loves to work out. He's very into, you know, triathlons and stuff. So he has a lot of freedom for that. But then there certainly are days where I'm like, bye, I'm going to go to a party and it's work and thanks for watching the kids. And um, he, I don't think he likes that, you know? Um, and it's it's a constant kind of balance, you know? Um, he'll try to go out to movies with friends. Like, I think just purposely to, to have something of his own to go do, you know? So we're always trying to do things. I do try to bring them on trips so that it's not just that I'm living a glamorous life, you know? Like... <laughs> Um, he chooses, he actually was my second shooter for years and years before children. So he gets to choose the weddings he wants to second shoot on, um, which is always like Hawaii and like, you know, like he's always like, those are the ones I want to come to. And so it's great. Cause you know, we have somebody, you know, grandma Ma's who watch the kids and he'll travel with me and shoot a little bit, but he always does shoot those weddings. And he's like, Oh, that's right. This isn't all fun and games. <laughs> it's like, this is hard work, you know? So I think it's always a balance. Some days he hates it. Some days he thinks it's the best thing in the world. Um, it's just different. And honestly, he's comfortable in his masculinity. I mean, I think that helps um, having to manage babies and, and little girls, especially. He manages two little girls with tutus and stuff. Um, and I just think that he's a great person for that. So How it fun. works out well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rad. And then what about for you? with the balance of being a mom and then also work, obviously it sounds like you love it, but yeah. it are, do you have the internal battles and struggles and feeling like you're not, you know, it's like feeling like you're not there enough and you should be and, and all yeah. that. And, and then how do you, it sounds like you're also very intentional. So how have you structured that? So you're okay with it? Yeah. You know, I think that, um, it is really hard, especially, and I always come back to that some days and when I'm super stressed out, but he's stressed out with children things, you know, like the kids are sick and I'm like, but I have this issue, you know, with work or something. And, and I'm like, but, Oh, you know, you're not making, you don't have to worry about signing a contract or something. This is a different kind of weight, you know, cause I feel a lot of times like I have the family weight cause I'm the mother and I'm the, you know, like we could be on this phone call right now and I very well could have a three-year-old running here cause she fell and hit her head. You know, like I don't get off from the family cause my office is in my home too. So I'm like, gosh, I have both of these things that I am having to be what feels like a hundred percent responsible for. Cause 
you know, fathers are great and fathers are amazing and have their own role, but there is a spot for a mother that little girls especially like <laughs> feel they always need at very inopportune times, you know. So um, it's stressful, you know, but I, I have the perspective at least of, you know, coming from a background where I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have any privilege really other than smart parents. You know, I will say they were intelligent, but beyond that, like I see now, I'm really grateful, I think for, for the stress of having a lot of business, you know? So I never really try to, I'm never like, Oh, this sucks. You know, these clients are tiring or I have so much work to do. Cause I'm like, God, how friggin' lucky that I have this problem, you know? So I think I think having perspective really helps mentally balance out the stress of me having to manage everything financially. Um, I like to save, you know? So I, I have a savings account and I just have goals that I wanna meet for that, which I think helps my stress go down. So that way, if something is really stressful financially, that I'm like, oh, that's okay, I have a savings account. Like that's what it's for is to relieve some of this stress, you know, and then I, I pull out for something like that. So that helps me a lot. Um, and then what was the other, what was the follow up? What was the second part of that? Do you remember? Yeah, I, th- I think it was just more that that mental game of how oh, yeah. you how you. Oh, it was more because you're intentional, like how do you structure the your sort of work life balance? Because yeah. obviously working out of the house, too, it's easy to constantly be working and it's easy to not turn off. Yeah. And then it's also hard to separate with your family knowing that it's work time versus like present time. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, especially in the busy season, I travel every weekend, which means I leave on Fridays, um, sometimes Thursdays, depending on how far away it is or something. And I don't get home until Sunday, but I've been working and my husband, I get home and he's like, ah, oh, you're home, you know, here, help with the babies. And then I'm like, oh no, but it's Monday. And so I have to get back in. Um, and so I think like, we all know that Mondays here at home in my office, those are work days. I don't really try to schedule anything. Cause I really, when I have to get back in from traveling, I have to catch back up on stuff. So Mondays are a way that I separate that's like usually protected. Um, but honestly, I tried for a while to have certain hours you know, like and say, oh, I'm going to have hours. And I respect people that can keep hours, but I just don't. Cause like sometimes I'm bored and I want to work at 11 PM, you know, or there's nothing good on Netflix. And I'm like, Ugh, I might as well edit, you know? So I don't have hourly boundaries at all. I think I just have like personal lines with how much time I want to spend with my kids and, you know, and that sort of thing. So I think I just mentally every day try to readjust, you know, some days I'm feeling extra guilty and I'm like, you know what, like I just blow off work for the day, you know, not a, never a wedding. We're talking like office work, you know? Um, and I, I take my kid out and we go do something fun or we take trips and stuff like that. So I think it's always just a constant check in and I try not to beat myself up because there are some times of the year where I'm a friggin' awesome mom. Like we're doing so much fun crap, you know, like, so, um, and then I'm a really awesome business owner. And I, I think there are some weeks where, I'm just a business owner and I'm trying to be mom as much as I can in the evenings before they go down to sleep or something. And I just try to give myself some grace to know that in the long run, that's going to balance out, but there's no, there's no schedule. I don't, there's my answer is I have no schedule. I just overarching on the macro sense. I try to make it work out. So. Yeah. And I, I think that is really, it sounds like your husband is okay with that and he mm-hmm. is good with that, you know? So I, that is, amazing because that can be the situation where, you know, you're feeling torn and that's the other person feels like you're working too much. You never turn off. And I'm speaking from my own experience. I recognize those same same complaints for sure. Yeah. I think, um, and there's definitely times where he'll check me, you know, I say I check myself, but there's definitely times where he's like, yes, so you're wrong about how you're balancing that, you know, (laughs) or something like that. Um, you know, my husband always tries to get, he likes his like outlet is like a workout every day when the girls nap. So, I mean, I think you have to listen to your spouse or your partner. If you, you are managing a family to listen to where they're at mentally too, because you might be in two different places. Like I might think I'm doing awesome, you know, <laughs> like, and he's like, yeah, no, this is stressful. You need to help out for this day or, you know, or something like that. So I think listening and, and that, that's the beauty of these jobs is that we really do have the ability to change things up if we need to, which is like mind blowingly cool. Right. Cause like if you work on a nine to five and your husband or your spouse is like, yeah, you don't work as much. You're like, well, sorry, <laughs> it's a nine to five, you know? So 
I think, um, you know, we just try to balance it in. And, and he thankfully, has, we've been together long enough, especially through weddings, that he gets, it's like an accountant's busy season. Like he knows, like right now, I shot six weddings and seven portraits in the last month. So between like October 8th and today, I shot six weddings and six portraits. So it's crazy right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, you know, he's given a little bit of grace there too. So, yeah, it's, I, I, I think that there's a lot of conversation. Why, why I'm asking the question is there's a lot of conversation just in general about balance and everyone seeking balance. And I, I've come, I think I came out of a place maybe like three years ago where I was like crashing because I, I was so mentally Mm -hmm. trying to be balanced, you know, and it's, and it's not, and I, what the realization that I've come to is an true balance isn't actually possible. And yeah. the the trick really in, in a lot of it, which it sounds like you're good at is intentionality and, and communication and building structure. I mean, when you're single, mm-hmm. if, if oh. I was single, I would be working all day long and oh, I, you know, I have it. a lot of projects going on and I would have even yeah. more and I'd probably be traveling more, yeah. but with the family and with the kids wanting to be a good dad, wanting to be you know, I, my wife doesn't, she's a stay at home mom. We're more of that typical Mm -hmm. role. Um, but you know, it's a lot of weight to be supporting the whole family, which, you know, but then also like wanting to be a good dad, wanting to be showing up, wanting to make sure that she's not exhausted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, but, but feeling like you can do all of that well at the same time doesn't work, but it's more so being 100% where you are when you're there versus like being here and being regretting that you're not there versus, you know, and then yeah. when you're working, you're 100% working. When you're with the kids, you're 100% with the kids. You put your phone away and you're present, you know? So those are the things that I've had to learn and then also give myself grace yes. with that. <laughs> I think absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, a family was so, I don't, I guess I always wanted a family, but I didn't know how it would, how much I would enjoy it, you know? Um, and I think, and maybe I caught on to that really quickly because it changes when you're the one carrying the babies, you know, totally. like your brain, the good Lord changes your brain to really make you focus on those things, you know, thankfully, I mean, they never survive adolescence, you know, but, um, you know, I think it's something that I realized quickly once I had children that I was going to change. Cause I think before I had them, I was like, no, I'm a badass. Like, I don't need, I don't need, a, I don't, who needs balance? You know, like totally. I'll, I'll make everybody happy. Um, and I, I mean, for me, cause I was pregnant and like I said, I do think it probably changes the mother's brain chemistry faster than it does the father's. Um, you know, I knew that, that my priorities would change and everybody actually said that to me. I remember being kind of annoyed as a, as a really good, a, a big go getter kind of a person that so many people would say like, Oh, but your priorities are going to change. And I remember thinking, you know what, you say that like, that's a bad thing, but I was a workaholic. I was obsessive. I mean, like to a detriment, you know, like it was just a a very kind of like, um, addictive personality, I think. And I was like, you know, if something is so powerful that it can come in and, and change my mindset that work is not the end all be all. And that I don't need to focus on that. Please let it. Because I I could feel that I had this addiction to work and I was so focused and hyper, you know, hyper just tuned in to what I could do to improve my business, you know, to an obsessive level. But they were right, clearly. And I was so I was like, I really hope that kids will do that. But I wasn't in the mindset before I had them that they would, you know. And so when I had children and they do change it, I'm like, oh, like this is what I need it. Like just for my own personality, you know, I don't need to be more sharpened and more focused on work because I'm just naturally really aggressive in that way. I needed something to straighten me out personally, you know, and, and that to me, that's what family really, and especially children has done is it's kind of just brought me down to a normal, socially acceptable level of work. <laughs> um, and, and helped me to kind of just reevaluate. And, and I don't think it'll be forever. You know, I think certainly when my kids are in school that I'll probably have a tendency to like crank back up, you know, um, but I'm okay with that. And so I'm really happy about the phase I'm in. I'm trying to enjoy it. Um, and, and I think so far I'm doing a good job at it, but I think that's because my level of valuation is probably very low. You know, they're totally. alive. They know I love them. We're all <laughs> <laughs> our house is going, you know, we have our house paid for, you know? So like, I think that, um, I think just having the perspective on, on, on how lucky we are to have every situation that we're speaking about, you know, really helps it to not be 
you know, too unbalanced for the yeah, most part. So. Totally. Do you limit the amount of weddings that you shoot? Do you have a number that you try to stick to? You know, I think, um, no, <laughs> I did 27 this year. It's a lot. Which is stupid. Yeah. Um, I always, I always say that I would really love to be between 18 and 20. I feel like that's just like the sweet spot and maybe not financially. Cause I always want more money. Of course. Um, but in terms of like, I want to work a lot. I don't want to do a couple weddings here. I want to do, I want to work a lot because I like it. I think you and I are similar in that way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I think I, I start really evaluating the weddings after about 22 and trying to say like, ooh, this is a nice, because I do take last minute weddings a lot, you know, like this is a l- nice last minute wedding to get some income and we're going to go on a trip, you know, or something <laughs> like that. Um, and so, and I do, I take them on for that reason. And it, but it's always, after 22, I will say it's a little bit more of a family discussion on like, hey, like, do I got time to do the extra? What could we use this money for? Where could it go? You know, so it's a little bit more intentional yeah. after that point. And so. is it more like squeezing another one into October or is it like the one in November, you know, or something oh, yeah. like that? Totally. Like my husband, if it's like, off season we're just like do it like who cares you know yeah um, I mean I have a wedding every month I don't think I have one in February but I have a wedding every month for like the foreseeable future like they're just spread out which I love um but yeah I mean I always take them if they're off season or off days or weekdays I'm always I'm always hustling you know to get those extra weddings in um versus portraits like Ugh. yeah I try not to take portraits <laughs> What, so what, what does hustle look like for you? Like, how do you feel like you're getting your work? Is it, it sounds like initially it all just sort of came to you, but are you, do you feel like you're hustling to still get work or is it just sort of coming in or you know, what? I think, I, I think it's kind of like tending a garden, you know, like sometimes you get out there and you're like, dang, this happened so quick and easy. But if you really thought about the work that went into it, you know, um, you know, so I, I really constantly am fostering connections with um, you know, with planners, with vendors, um, I love to to share my imagery with vendors, which I think a lot of times then they're sharing it. And so then it's just, you know, a lot of people are seeing it on social media and stuff like that. So, you know, when I get down to, you know, over 25 or something, honestly, I will give discounts if somebody's like, hey, my wedding's in six or eight weeks. And I'm like, what's your budget? Totally. Like, you know, like I can do that. You yeah. Know? I mean, it's astounding. I don't do a lot of them, but I certainly think maybe two to three two, two or three year where they are getting crazy deals, you know, like, because I am, I I'm just like, Hey, like, this is where we want to get a little bit more money. So I do hustle, you know, I get the bulk of my weddings and very last minute, you know, within, I do get weddings like within two months out or something Mm -hmm. like that. I'll give great deals for that, you know? And to me, that's, that's how I hustle is I feel like I do have a really steady stream of inquiries and it's up to me to decide what price point I want to accept those inquiries. So I'm not having to necessarily hustle for people to be interested, but I'm hustling to convince them to raise their price point or to, you know, get somebody, I had people change dates a lot. I always feel like that's part of the like conversation. I'm like, Oh, I'm not available, but if you'd move it to the next day, I will give you a friggin' amazing deal. Cause you know, I know I'm like in a city and I can do double headers or something like that. So to me, I think it's always knowing where I'm at financially and being really, um, you know, not afraid to address topics of price with clients. Like I can talk about anything phone. I don't, phone calls don't scare me with clients. I will talk budget all day, you know? Um, and I think too, telling clients like, you know, Hey, this is just being open about my price point, but especially when I'm giving those last minute deals, you know, being open about pricing and not being like, so, you know, just let me know if it works. I'm like, so what's, what is your budget? And then I don't necessarily, I will say this, the way that I do those, like, I guess the, those last two or three, I add on to a year that are last minute or something. I don't necessarily, um, give them a price, you Mm -hmm. know, of what I'm going to offer. I will say, what is your price point? And, and they could say something crazy low and I'll be like, I could give you two hours, you know, like, yeah. so I don't give them a price. I ask what their budget is. Cause I want them to be honest, you know, I don't want them to ever try to undercut. And then sometimes I'll be like, well, I mean, I could give you a couple hours, you know, or something like that. And then sometimes they'll actually increase it. Cause I think a lot of times they undercut those anyways. Oh, when yeah. they, they pitch you those. So. Or sometimes parents are giving them a budget and they just have no idea. They're just pulling numbers out of the hat. Cause it sounds like a lot yes. of money and it does yes. sound like a lot of money. <laughs> for, sure, for sure. Yeah. So, so I think not being afraid to really aggressively go after those with enthusiasm and, and, you know, sometimes I think I do open up the conversation, um, because I like to think that my personality is a selling point too. You know, my images, I think, pull them in the door and get them really 
interested in me. And then I like to like sell them on me as a person. And sometimes selling them on me as a person is giving them a comparison of what the alternatives are, you know? And so I'll say, you know, please go out there. I will tell my clients, I'm like, please go ask for five galleries from any photographer you're considering. And I'm sure other photographers hate me for that. Like, you know, I'm like, but they should be able to. And I do, you know, I give five galleries as soon as somebody is, is really interested. And I mean, I could give them 10 or 20. You know, like, and I always almost to like, it's like I'm playing a poker game with the other photographer that they're considering, you know, and I'm like, hey, like, I mean, I feel like I've got the skill. I'm going to show them all my cards and I'll tell them you need to know the experience. You know, I'll tell them to go after and ask things. And I, so I think maybe putting a little bit of that idea into the client's head about what they're considering and not just saying your pictures are pretty, but like, so are the other persons and they're half the price, you know, um, I, I sell myself, but I also sell the what if on if they didn't choose me, you know, totally. <laughs> and and there's something to say that people don't understand the experience, you know, and there's yeah. a lot of like the Instagram world where people have a lot of followers, but it's really easy to post one good photo, yeah, you know, versus being able to <laughs> consistently shoot at this sort of level. But then also like your photographer runs your day, you know, so there's that element of, you know, being able to bring that expertise, which only comes from experience and, you know, personality too. Yeah, right. I know we can just talk about how great we are. <laughs> um, I um, yeah, you know, I think that's true, and I definitely try to use it as a as you know weapon in my arsenal of getting clients over to me and stuff. And and I'll always be like, you know, well, whoever you choose, just make sure you love them. And you know, like I'll definitely put it in their heads where they're like, oh, that's right. And just kind of opening them, opening them up to that the idea that there's more than just the photos, you know. And like that's one of the reasons I send all the galleries because you know I truly. Really, I'm certain this is a narcissistic tendency, but I, 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 I truly think that my galleries are just as beautiful as my Instagram and my website. I'm, I'm, I lament sometimes. I'm like, oh, there's so many pretty things that nobody ever gets to see, you know, because I totally. just don't have time. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think maybe having that confidence in my work that's not visible, I think maybe just even the confidence that that gives helps clients to to get that it's worth the investment or something like that, you know? So. Absolutely. And so shifting gears just a little bit, and then I yeah. won't take too much more of your time. No, the um, branding and like, and you love you, I know you're, you've got a great brand and um, yeah. can you talk about how that plays into it and sort yeah. of what you think about you know, branding? I think I've always loved branding. So I've always done my own websites, my own brands. Like I've never had anybody else do it because I was probably a little bit too type A. Like even when somebody would do something, I'm like, I don't like it. I could do better, <laughs> you know? Um, so I've always loved branding in that way. And I always looked at it like, you know, there was a point in my photography career when I was first starting and I was like, who am I as a photographer? You know, the big philosophical, like, am I moody? Am I light? And at that point, you know, I don't even, when I, so I started shooting, I didn't do weddings 2012, but I was shooting in like 2009, like portrait, you know, little things. Um, But I, I really didn't know. I had to figure it out. And I started realizing what I was drawn to and what I was shooting most was, you know, certainly more of an editorial. I tried the doc, the super documentary, you know, right. like leave the Coke can and the bra on the table and shoot it. And I just couldn't handle it, yeah, yeah. you know? And to me, that extends to my brand, you know? So to me, I said, okay, well, if I, I want to shoot in a way that I can continue to do and sustain it, even if I do love other people's work that is totally different from mine. And I think they're phenomenal. I just can't do it and sustain it. And so I looked at branding the same way. You know, there are some brands, you know, especially like the lighter and the air, like the super airy and like delicate and minimal. And I'm like, oh my God, it's so pretty. I just think it's so pretty. (laughs) But then I'm like, I cannot do that. You know, like I love vibrant and I love bold and extra, you know, like if if my Instagram handle could just be extra, I would have chosen it, you know, but, um, and I think hence your lipstick choice. I mean, right. I wear this every single day too. Um, I had a friend in high school that thought it was tattooed on because I literally wear it every day. Um, so I think that finding the kind of client that I could serve best, even if it wasn't the one that I would have like said, oh, this is the one that is the the coolest or the prettiest. I've really fallen in love with a client that I think values, you know, color and vibrancy. And, um, and, and once I said, you know, I want clients that like what I like, because that's really all I can make. 
um, I started finding clients that were a little bit more eclectic or would do different things. And that's, that's really where I would, you know, get excited. You know, you spoke earlier to like meeting them and finding that connection is really what made your heart sing. And I think really finding interesting people in interesting situations and stories, like you don't even know half the stories because I'm not going to share everybody's like family story on my Instagram, but I just really love that. And I think that the brand that I've set up, which is for me personally, because it's how I am, is colorful and confident and vibrant. I really try to speak to that, that woman specifically, because I am very female centric in my branding, I think. <laughs> but guys seem to like it too. Um, but I really try to speak to the woman that would see me and say, man, I would wish I could be that girl's friend. And I think, you know, at least in terms of stylistically and personality wise, being really open to the kind of clients that some people don't even want. So I say that because I really love type A clients. And I mean, I wish I could have on my website for type A people, you know, because <laughs> I feel like there's a missing, there's a gap out there where a lot of photographers are like, oh, red flags. You know, these clients are very specific about what they want. They're very like, giving you like spe specifications of what they expect. And I'm like, look, I'm so type A, I know how to speak their language, yeah. you know, like, and so trying to brand myself towards clients that expect a lot. Um, and I'm okay with that. And I'm like, look, you expect a lot. I'm the girl for you. Like, I get you, you know, like, I have girls sometimes and they're like, you know, I just don't want a fat arm. I don't want a fat arm. And instead of being like, ugh, she's going to be a mess to photograph. I'm like, oh girl, no, me either. Like, let, like I know how to help you. You know, so I think yeah. finding a way to find clients that I would genuinely enjoy being around has really helped me And using branding and, and not just, you know, the stylistic branding, which I think it is really similar to my personality. A lot of people say my website looks like my personality, which I like. Um, but I think just people that temperament wise, you know, like we work well together, even if it's not stylistically has been such an amazing thing because I love it. You know, I just love watching their story, even if a client's not going to bring me into their story personally, because sometimes, like I said, I have clients, I don't know, you know, like, I'm like, it's so great to meet you and we become friends, but I don't, I don't know anything about them and I don't talk to them after. Um, I really love watching them as an outsider and being able to be that close to them, you know, these amazing, intriguing people. Um, that's what I like, even if they're not going to be my best friend. I'm just like the little girl front row, like, this is really cool. You're really cool. You know, like, like um, so that's what I love. Um, and I feel really grateful that I've gotten a lot of that. And so I just continue to kind of go towards that direction because I think I'm really good at surpassing those kind of people's expectations. And that's good business. Because they refer amazing you to business. Their other cool friends that have high expectations. So, so yeah. Oh, well, I love that. And thanks so much for sharing everything. I know you're speaking somewhere coming up. Can you talk about that? And if people want to come see you and then where can other people find your work and all that jazz? Yeah. So, um, and, um, let's see, it's going to be next May and I know they haven't, they're going to release a little bit more information this week, but so next May in Asheville, I'm going to be speaking at the hybrid co conference, which I'm really excited about. Um, cause I do love talking. So, um, I'm really excited about that. And I know they're going to announce a little bit more later this week. So they're going to have all the information there, but any chance I can get, I really try to find a place to, to speak up and chat because, um, you know, for so long I worked with Gary sweet Gary, you know, and it was just us. And, um, I really feel like the community of photographers and stuff, like there are coworkers now Totally. and we kind of have this big world of it. And I really just love kind of broadening my base of basically friends. So, um, so that's what I'm going to be doing is making friends in Nashville with hybrid go though. <laughs> love that. Well, if you're interested in learning about film and shooting photography and mixing in digital as well, that's yeah. what the hybrid code does. Check that out. And then your Instagram and websites, just Perry Vale. Yep. It's all Perry Vale. I try to make it real simple, easy to follow. Oh, rad. Well, thanks so much for just sharing your time, your knowledge, and you are an awesome person. Keep awesome. at it. Thank you. I had so much fun. So I appreciate it. Cool. Well, thanks, Barry.